Good afternoon. It's still afternoon <clears throat> by a little bit. So I'm Dan Colley, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this historic day to kick off the lecture in the, the 2009 series, Global Diseases, Voices from the Vanguard. So Voices from the Vanguard is a joint effort between the Center for Tropical and Emerging Global Diseases and Pat Thomas, the Knight Chair in Health and Medical Journalism in the, the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication. Before I move ahead, I just want to say that there are three more in this series. I hope you will come back for them. And also that there's a reception following Dr. Hoffman's talk in Demosthenian Hall, to which you are all welcome. Now, the purpose of this series has always been and remains the true theme of this inauguration day, that is bringing people together. And by that, I mean for the Voices series, it's intended to bring together people from across the campus here at UGA, and especially those interested in some aspect, any aspect of global health. So I'm glad you're here today. I think you're going to be uh, glad you're here too, although I'm sorry for the delay. But today's speaker is someone who knows all the many facets of global health. From the front lines in back corners of the world, to sophisticated research laboratories, to public health policy meeting rooms, to medical clinics on both sides of the bedpan, if you will, and modern industrial facilities. There are not many people on this earth who have participated in more aspects of global health than today's Voices speaker, Dr. Stephen L. Hoffman. Steve went to Penn and then Cornell for medical school, did his house staff training in San Diego, uh, got a diploma in tropical medicine from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And he's the recipient of many, many honors and has the distinction of being the most cited author on malaria from 1995 to 2005, which happened to be a time when malaria work was expanding enormously. He's headed major government research operations and founded a company against the advice of just about all his friends and colleagues, but with the support of his wife, Dr. Kim Lee Sim, and his family. In 2006, he obtained $29.3 million to build a facility in which to pursue this grail. The facility opened in the fall of 2007. Now, I'm not going to tell you about that because he will, and you can also read it in Esquire and Scientific American. I will also not list Steve's many, many honors because it would take too much time and that we don't have right now. And furthermore, Steve's not one to rest on his laurels. He has a story to tell, and I will now ask him to tell you. I'm pleased to present Dr. Stephen Hoffman, founder and chief executive of Scenaria Inc., a man who knows global health and who acts on his ideas. Thank you. So that doesn't help me. Well, I've learned how to deal with adversity. Um, I don't have a pointer. I can't hit the switcher. Um, but it's really uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here on this historic day. Um, I'm sure it was as thrilling for you as it was for me, and I'm just really happy that there was a, a poet in between Barack Obama and me speaking. So I didn't have to follow his act. Um, but um, uh, I'm really pleased to be here and hope that uh, by hearing what I have to say, some of you will be excited about pursuing a career in global health. Next slide, please. So um, as many of you, I think, know, malaria is uh, responsible for more deaths in children in the world than any other single infectious agent, Plasmodium falciparum is. Um, thousands of children will die today of malaria and an estimated million in the next year. Next slide. So scenario. Does anybody know what malaria means? What's the word come from? Bad air from Italian. So what is sanaria? Healthy air. All right. 
um, is the only company in the world that's dedicated entirely to developing a malaria vaccine. Um, next slide. So back, here we go. So before I go into scenario and what we're doing, I thought it might be useful um, to hear a little bit about how I got there. So uh, I was a second year medical student at Cornell and at that time there was no such thing as global health and Cornell was the only uh, medical school in the entire country that had a required course in tropical medicine taught by a rather flamboyant professor named Ben Keen. And uh, every day in the second year of medical school, uh, for three weeks, for four hours, and it actually usually stretched for six hours, we sat in a course where Ben Keen brought in a tropical medicine specialist from all over the world. And by the end of that course, it was clear in my mind that I was going to spend my career with a white linen suit, Panama hat, bottle of rum in my pocket, a cigar, and being a tropical medicine specialist. Wasn't quite sure how I was going to get there, but that was the idea. So next slide. I got a, that summer, I got a NIH fellowship to study diets for malnourished children in uh, Colombia, and uh, I got so enthralled with it that I withdrew from medical school and spent a year traveling around uh, South America. Next slide. Uh, that was my major professor, Donna Polinar, who was a brujo or a witch doctor in the Caqueta, which is the upper Amazon uh, jungle of, of, of Colombia an area you can't go to now because of uh, cocaine laboratories. Next slide. And I really experienced tropical medicine firsthand because I got hospitalized with typhoid fever in southern Cuenca, southern Ecuador in a place called Cuenca for 10 days, uh, had amoebic dysentery three times and giardiasis three times. And I certainly, can, if you can imagine, I wasn't going to call up my mother and father from southern Ecuador and say I'm in the hospital with typhoid fever. So I kind of grinned and bear it and was in a ward uh, where the only people in the ward had typhoid or hepatitis. Next slide. So I came back from that experience energized and with the idea that I was going to spend my career as in tropical medicine and had the vision that I would be kind of a Dr. Schweitzer uh, in the middle of the tropics someplace and had to learn everything. So I uh, went into a family medicine residency, the University of California, San Diego, and then followed that uh, with a diploma in tropical medicine hygiene at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and was raring to go uh, off to the tropics, do clinical tropical medicine and look for a job. And I could get jobs with universities um, to study the cell surface coat of schistosomes or leishmaniasis and I was offered a job with the CDC as an epidemiology intelligence officer, in serve, EIS service officer. But I really wanted to just take care of patients. And uh, somebody came up to me and said, you know, um, there's these, why don't you join, you know, why don't you join this guy, Dave Dennis, who was, was in Jakarta, Indonesia at the time. Uh, and I said, you know, I think the guy's in the Navy. And um, they said, nah, he never wears a uniform. Not, definitely not in the Navy. In any case, I got in touch with them. And uh, next slide, uh, I joined the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> see the world, and went off uh, to Jakarta with uh, my eight-month-old son, and uh, you, you'll learn about in a second here, and my, my wife, and, um, and started doing clinical tropical medicine and primarily focusing, uh, next slide, on typhoid fever, uh, which was killing the most, you know, a lot of people in Jakarta, and this is my colleague, Dr. Narain Punjabi, and we did this a uh, study of a, a new treatment for typhoid fever in which we reduced the hospital mortality of severe typhoid from 55% to 10% and basically eliminated the mortality in that hospital. And that was the first study I ever did. It took a year and a half almost living in the hospital with doing a study in which death was the primary outcome variable. But pretty exciting when this is when we, the code, we were in Jakarta, the code was broken by a CDC epidemiologist in Singapore and sent us back the results which said it worked. And that's the champagne celebrating it. And I, it's safe, it's certain to say that since that day in 1982, I've never had that degree of success. It was a bad thing, it was a great thing, but to start your career where you actually did something that saved lives was ex rather extraordinary. And I've been trying to catch up ever since. I then started working on uh, malaria, 
uh, if you're in tropical medicine, or at least you know in that part of the world, it was clear that that was really the number one problem. And uh, we used to go fly out to an island next to Timor uh, uh, called Flores, uh, land on a grass landing strip, take a jeep down to the coast, and then take this kind of like African queen boat out to the village where we'd stay for a few weeks um, studying malaria. Next slide. And that was our research team. I don't know if they dressed that way at the University of Georgia, but that was my staff <laughs> having, at the end of the day, a coconut uh, a pina colada. You know. Next slide. Uh, and we were studying tropical splenomegaly syndrome, and I'm told that uh, from Dr. Moore that if you can figure out who in this slide doesn't have tropical splenomegaly syndrome, you'll get an A. Next slide. Um, next. And this is another woman uh, in the highlands of New Guinea, which is uh, Irian, it was then called Irian Jaya, now called Papua, Indonesian West New Guinea, who also had uh, a disease called, it's now called hyperreactive malaria splenomegaly. It's caused by chronic malaria infection. So malaria is not just a disease of children in the developing world. It has many other uh, impacts uh, pathophysiologically. And this woman weighed 35 kilograms and her spleen weighed five kilograms. And you can imagine if you live in a rural agrarian society and you have to drag that around with you, you don't do very well, and it eats up your red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, and so on. Next slide. So um, I then wasn't doing as well with malaria as I had done with typhoid fever, so I started interviewing witch doctors and searching for a cure. Next slide. And this was uh, back at Donna Polinar in, in South America, and. Everybody seemed to say that they had a cure. Next slide. Um, this was a nurse in the highlands of New Guinea. Next slide. This guy was uh, another witch doctor. And everybody, they all said they knew how to cure malaria. Next slide. But fortunately, back up for a second. I, back, forward, there we go. So that's my son, um, who is now a 29-year-old lawyer in Denver. And he decided to come with me on, as I interviewed these guys. Next slide. What happened there? <laughs> there you go. And uh, he found a lot of different fellas. Next slide. And, uh, geez. <laughs> and all of them said that they had a cure for malaria. But he was rather precocious, so he told me to get a malaria smear on them, and they were all positive. So we abandoned that approach. Next slide. And I actually, at that point, after spending five years in Indonesia, came back to the United States um, with the idea of working on mal developing a malaria vaccine. I had had many, you know, literally hundreds of children die in my arms that I couldn't, you know, that I treated, and many of them got better, but many of them didn't. And it was a, a terrific feeling of inadequacy. Um, and, you know, you would, we would treat somebody go to their bedside, think we cured them of hypoglycemia or something like this, and you know, congratulate ourselves that you know, if, they, if we weren't there, they would have died. Two hours later, the nurse said they died. And uh, it was really clear that something else needed to be done. And this was at the time of the beginning of molecular biology, cloning of genes, and so on. So I came back to the United States and began working on malaria vaccine development. Next slide. Um, and spent uh, several years, and this was kind of, we all thought we were going to Nobel Prize. And, and in 1984, this is just before I came back, the gene encoding the circumsporozoid pro protein of Plasmodium falciparum had been cloned, sequenced, and published in Science Magazine. And um, there was a press conference held in Washington, which Dan probably remembers, and it was, it was clearly stated there was going to be a malaria vaccine in five years. That was 84. Now, in 83, there had been a similar press conference in Australia uh, at the Walter Eliza Hall, where they had cloned some genes. Um, and so every kind of five years, there's been another five-year window on a malaria vaccine. But in any case, that gene was cloned and sequenced and published in June, August of 84. And in July of 19, June of 1987, less than three years later, we published the first paper. It was a year-long study uh, showing that a vaccine could be made with this protein, that it was safe, immunogenic, and actually protected somebody. 
So there's a whole field out there um, called translational research, which aims to go from the bench to the bedside. And 25 years ago, we were able to do that in two and a half, three years. And at this, you know, before we got the results, because it only protected one out of six people, uh, we thought we were going to win the Nobel Prize right then and there. Um, and it helps to have that kind of vision, but uh, that grandiosity often doesn't really get you to the end of the day. In any case, um, we started doing uh, field studies. This is in Kenya, uh, where uh, I was going out to get some lymphocytes from volunteers. And the, 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 the Pre President Obama, by the way, is from Western Kenya, this town, Kisumu, where this plane crash was. And he is a Luo. And the ruling tribe in, in Kenya are the Kikuyu. And in this particular plane, the pilot was a Kikuyu and the co-pilot was a Luo. And they had a fight and forgot to put the landing gear down. And so we like, this is how we landed about a, a kilometer from the, uh, from, from, from the terminal. Next slide. Uh, there was some pleasure associated with it. That's my wife, Dr. Sim. Next slide. Um, and um, some, you know, interesting ways of, of bathing uh, out on field trips. Next slide. Um, but in any case, how did we end up, I'm going to truncate some years here, getting from those early studies to Scenaria? So um, we, in 87 or 86, 87, when we were a bit disappointed by the results, we began testing multiple subunit vaccines based on the circumsporozoite protein, which is the major surface protein on sporozoites, and it is the basis of the vaccine of which there's been a lot of publicity re recently called RTSS ASO1, developed by uh, GlaxoSmithKline and the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, and the furthest one along. And what we were testing was the actual predecessor of that. So we've actually been working on that particular protein as a vaccine since 1984, and that's 25 years. And it's still got a ways to go. In any case, it wasn't giving us the results that we, we thought we needed, and so we began playing with other formulations of it. We expressed it in different ways, made uh, conjugates, gave it with multiple different adjuvants, and we got the, cranked up the protective efficacy to about 20, 25 percent. Um, I was the director of the Navy's malaria program, and my job was to make a vaccine to prevent malaria in the Marines. And, uh, and Navy SEALs and, and so on. And that, for a vaccine like that, it has to be 90% eff efficacious, or I can't go to the Commandant of the Marine Corps and say, I got a vaccine, or I couldn't send any of anybody in this room to, on a safari to Kenya or to work in the Peace Corps or to do some type of work. You need a vaccine that really is protective if you're gonna forego a medication. Uh, and I came to the conclusion in 1989 that a single protein vaccine would, no matter how it was delivered, would never give that degree of protective immunity. And in, even against the same strain of parasite, but the fact is that we can go to Kenya today or somewhere and, and one kid will be infected with 10 different strains of Plasmodium falciparum that vary at key epitopes in that uh, particular protein. So. Um, we decided um, to start immunizing people by the bite of irradiated infected mosquitoes. Now, it had been shown in the early 1970s that you actually could immunize people by the bite of irradiated infected mosquitoes, and a few people had been protected. And that was the foundation for the discovery of the circumsporozoite protein by Dr. Nusenswey's group at NYU, with the idea that, that maybe that was what the immunity was against. And it seemed clear to me that it wasn't as if there was 5,000 genes in the genome that's unlikely that it was against one protein, particularly since we couldn't measure very good immune responses against that protein in people immunized with irradiated sporozoites. So we decided to start re-immunizing people by the bite of irradiated infected mosquitoes that have these sporozoites in their salivary glands and to determine the mechanisms of protective immunity, the immune mechanisms, the targets of the protective immunity, meaning which pieces of the parasite, which genes, which proteins, which epitopes on those proteins were the targets of the protection, and then to build a subunit vaccine. Anybody tell me what a subunit vaccine is? What do you think subunit means? I mean, it's part of the whole. 
so that um, in all of us in this room have been uh, potentially immunized with about 26 vaccines which are on the market in the United States. Of those, there are two recombinant protein subunit vaccines. Anybody know what those are? Hepatitis B and? I'm sure there's some women here who got this vaccine in the last uh, few years. HPV, human papillomavirus vaccine. That's it. There's only two. We've been working on this for 25 years, and we've only managed to get two on. All the other vaccines come from material actually made by the infectious agent that we're trying to immunize against. And half of those, or 16 of the 26, are actually the entire infectious agent. And 13 of those are what we call live attenuated. They're actually the, the virus or bacteria itself which has been rendered non-virulent by some means. And um, what we were trying to do is make a better subunit vaccine. This is 18, 1989, 1990. And during the next 10 years, we did identify more clearly the mechanisms of protective immunity. And we were able to sequence the, the genome, which we started also that project of Plasmodium falciparum to get at the targets and then tested all kinds of subunit vaccines. So uh, the first uh, uh, E. coli produced recombinant protein vaccine ever to go in human beings was malaria vaccine. The first DNA vaccine ever given to a normal human being I administered, it was a malaria vaccine. The first recombinant virus vaccine that had multiple antigens in it was a malaria vaccine. and. By 1999, I came to the conclusion it was going to be another 20 or 25 years before we would have such a vaccine um, that met the requirements that I thought were necessary, which was 90 percent protective immunity. Um, and at that point, uh, there, we had started the uh, malaria genome sequencing project with Craig Venter from Tiger, uh, the Institute for Genomic Research, and we had become quite friendly. and he had announced in 1998 that uh, despite the fact that the uh, public sector was going to uh, sequence the human genome in 10 years for $3 billion, that he was going to do it in three years for $300 million. And um, he kept coming to me and saying, you know, like, join Solera, we'll do this, you know, we'll turn, you'll turn the genome into new biologics and so on. And I said, well, I got well, like one more year in the Navy and I can get my retirement, you know, so <laughs> let's wait. But in any case, uh, around this time of 2000, I re retired from the Navy and joined Solera to be the head of biologics to turn the human genome into um, new Im immunotherapeutics for cancer. And I guess that was because I had been so successful or unsuccessful for malaria, I might as well try something, something else that was easy, like cancer, right? In any case, um, Solera uh, was really quite an, an incredibly exciting place at the time, probably the most exciting place in the whole world of biotechnology. But a year later, Craig Venter had been fired by the management, and he was my best friend there. And in the meantime, I started analyzing the data from these 10 years of immunizing people by the bite of irradiated infected mosquitoes. Um, and I. To my astonishment, I looked at it and I said, you know, I've been wasting my time for the last 10 or 15 years. If I had tried to make a vaccine out of sporozoites, we would have a vaccine. Um, because, next slide, um, and this just shows how it's done. In that container there, there's uh, 300 infected mosquitoes that have been irradiated. And when a volunteer uh, has been bitten by 1,000 of those irradiated infected mosquitoes, I'm up to 3,000 at this point. Um, next slide. That fact, the volunteer will be protected against the challenge with live, non-irradiated mosquitoes with sporozoites in them. There have been 14 volunteers in the world's literature uh, that have had that exposure. 13 of the 14, when challenged, up to 10 weeks after their last exposure, were completely protected against malaria. In uh, the next row down, uh, six of those people were rechallenged within 10 weeks 15 times. There was 100 percent protection. And six people were challenged as late as 42 weeks, nine and a half months after their last exposure, and five of the six were completely protected of malaria. 
If you look up in the right-hand corner, you see 33 out of 35. So there's been 35 challenges and total protection against malaria in 33 out of the 35 challenges, or 94%. Now, that's as good protective immunity as any vaccine for any indication. If you go down on the immunizing bites, the last row there, less than 1,000, the protection goes down. So there's a dose response. You need a certain level of, of the vaccine, which is not dissimilar to other vaccines. You need a dose to get to at which point you have protection. Next slide. So as I said, these were limited studies, 35 challenges in 14 people, but the protective immunity was as good as the protective immunity of any vaccine for any indication. Next slide. This hadn't been, there had been some indication of this in the literature before, so why wasn't it pursued? Well, the, the sporozoites, the immunogen, were in mosquitoes, and no one had ever made a vaccine in, in mosquitoes, or any other biologic for that matter. Um, and then, of course, as I said, we had the discovery and, and cloning of these major targets, the circumsporozoite protein at the sporozoite stage of the parasite's life cycle, the um, mer merozoite surface protein one uh, at the red blood cell stage. And so everybody had thought for the last 15 years that a subunit recombinant vaccine was imminent. Well, the imminence gets old after a while. And so, next slide. Um, I decided to resign from Solera and start Scenaria in my kitchen or with my now the son who had been with me out in the highlands of New Guinea, had graduated from college, gone off to Hawaii for a year, where he was like a mate on a, first mate on a, on a 65 foot catamaran, taking people snorkeling and scuba diving, and, and um, decided he wanted to go to law school, called me up, and then he had to take some, you know, to, to apply. So he came to work with me, and we started the company. And what was the rationale? <coughs> First of all, we had an immunogen, maybe for the first time in the history of vaccinology, for a vaccine, for a, for a, a disease for which there wasn't a vaccine, we actually knew something that worked. We didn't have to discover it. We didn't have to do any fancy immunology or molecular biology to find out what the target was. It was there, staring at us in the face. The success was going to be based on bioengineering and applied entomology, parasitology, and biology, meaning producing a vaccine in mosquitoes and controlling all the elements of the production process. And remember, I just come from place, place Solero, where the impossible had been achieved. And so uh, there was this sense that one with good people, good team, focused effort could actually solve something. Um, and then I called up, I wasn't that nuts, and I called up the head of the Center for Biologics at the FDA and said, um, you know, I'm thinking about doing this. Am I off my rocker here? I mean, you know. And the FDA became quite supportive of, of what we were doing. And then I called up a fellow by the name of Maurice Hilleman. He was the director of the Merck Vaccine Institute. Um, and he is personally responsible for half the vaccines that anybody in this room has received. Uh, there's a fantastic book uh, uh, written by Dr. Offit called Vaccinated, which is his biography, which just came out. And I really would recommend that. Tremendous guy, and he became incredibly excited and the first per member of our advisory board. And uh, we thought that we had a plan for paying for development and deployment in Africa because we would have the same vaccine for the entire world, and there was a potential traveler's market for this vaccine. Next slide. So um, our approach was different than uh, all other approaches for malaria vaccine development in two fundamental ways. One is, ours was live attenuated. And remember, the majority of vaccines that we've gotten are live attenuated. All other approaches were subunit recombinant. And the second was that uh, we were aiming to prevent infection in greater than 90% of recipients, and not because they didn't want to, but all of the other approaches were aimed at reducing the rate at which people become infected to reduce the morbidity or the illness associated or, and mortality, but not to prevent infection because it was not possible to do with those approaches to vaccine development. So we were rather grandiose and still are um, in terms of getting off the ground. Next slide. So why we're working on an attenuated live vaccine, not a recombinant or synthetic. Next slide. Because it has to do with the intended characteristics of the vaccine uh, of getting greater than 90% protection. Next slide. And 
So this level of protection had been elicited by the immunogen, these sporozoites, but never by any subunit recombinant approach, nothing even close. Next slide. And so who would be immunized to fulfill our mission? Uh, the primary target group is infants in sub-Saharan Africa. There's 25 million born annually. Uh, a million of that 25 million eventually die of malaria, so 4%. Um, they all get malaria. Pre-adolescent and early adolescent girls, there's a new cohort of 7.5 to 10 million annually. Um, and this would be to reduce fetal loss and morbidity and mortality in the offspring associated with the low birth weights which are associated with malaria. How long did I say that we know this vaccine lasts for? Nine and a half to 10 months. How long does pregnancy last for? Okay, it would be a pretty, potentially a pretty good vaccine if you could immunize before pregnancy. Now we don't know how long it lasts for. I only know it lasts for at least nine and a half months. We haven't tested it beyond that and that will be part of our vaccine testing program. Travelers from non-endemic countries, uh, which there's you know, tens of millions, an estimated 100 million, and then there's many other populations in the developing world. And as we get better, so the, having, as we're getting better at controlling malaria, uh, in some places it, the deaths have been dramatically brought down and we're thinking about eliminating plasmodium falciparum, not just controlling it, and that brings a whole other strategy to the forefront, which is if you're going to eliminate it, you have to eliminate transmission, and I'll get to that at the end, but that thinks you're starting to think about mass administration of the vaccine, not just the targeted population. Next slide. Next. Okay. So um, I should have had this in the beginning, but I'm now I'm going to tell you about the life cycle of Plasmodium falciparum. Um, or any, any malaria parasite. So if you start up there with a the mosquito biting, a female Anopheles mosquito biting from dusk until dawn inoculates sporozoites, which are those little critters there with, with a little dot in the middle. They are uninucleate, one nucleus, and they get into the liver probably within five to 10 minutes, in some cases faster, where during the course of about a week, a uninucleate sporozoite develops to a mature liver stage parasite called a schizont, which has 10,000 to 40,000 nuclei. <coughs> Unbelievable amplification process in the liver. They're now called merozoites, each one of these uninucleate parasites, and they rupture out of the liver, and each one can invade a different red blood cell. And during the course of 48 hours, a, a merozoite replicates again and divides about 10 to 20 times, and so you get a mature red blood cell stage schizont, which has perhaps 10 or 20 nuclei, which means that every 48 hours in your bloodstream, there's a tenfold amplification of the parasite burden in your body. Alternatively, if you look at the bottom, they can develop to gametocytes, which is the sexual stage, which is taken up by the mosquitoes and takes two weeks to develop to <coughs> sporozoites in the mosquitoes. Now there's no clinical symptoms or signs or pathology associated with the sporozoites in the circulation, the parasite developing within the liver, the merozoites when they're released from the red blood cells or those gametocytes. It's only the cycle of invasion development, rupture, and reinvasion of red blood cells that causes the disease we know as malaria. So if you were going to develop a vaccine, what would you target it against? Anybody? What? The pre, what? Pre-blood stages. Good. It's called pre-erythrocytic stages. That's when you have a chance. There's no symptoms, signs, pathology associated with it. Now, ideally, you would like to target the sporozoite, right, the first stage, but you have about five minutes to do the job there. And if you get, you know, if you get 90% of them and one gets through, what happens a week later? There's 40,000 coming out the back door of the liver. So, um, whereas you have a week to attack them in the liver, um, and the immune responses that you would like to engender, or you can engender, is antibodies against the sporozoites because they're extracellular or T-cell responses against the infected hepatocyte. 
So what happens with a radiation attenuated sporozoite? The sporozoites look identical to non-irradiated sporozoites. They wiggle on a slide the same way. They actually invade liver cells exactly the same way. And they start to express new proteins exactly the same way. For the first three days after they go into a hepatocyte, uh, you can't tell the difference physically or by microscopy between a radiated or a non-irradiated sporozoite. At that point, the irradiated sporozoites stop. They don't replicate. They don't make those 10,000 nuclei. So the parasites are metabolically active, but non-replicating. And that means that the only place they could induce an immune response against is the sporozoites to make antibodies or the early liver stage T cells. And we believe that the primary protective immune response is T cells against the early liver stage. So that if you get immunized properly, your body has learned how to respond and it makes these antibodies and T cells which prevent the parasite from ever developing. Next slide. So, um, all we, back up for a second. So that what we had to do was figure out how are we going to, in the laboratory, make these sporozoites and put them in a bottle and keep them stable and potent. Um, and they have to be, as I tell you, sterile. And so that the way that we do that is we take gametocytes, those things at the bottom, culture them. We grow sporozoites, mosquitoes, they have to be sterile. Um, feed them, allow the parasites to develop so the mosquito becomes like the bioreactor or the cell line. And then at the end of two weeks, extract the sporozoites, purify them, and put them in a bottle. Next slide. Easier said than done. So we've, since we started Scenaria, we've had several phases. First was research and development to figure out how to do this. The second was process development where you turned it into a manufacturing process. The third was to actually manufacture, and the fourth, which is going to begin in April or May, is to start clinical trials. Next slide. Research and development. Next slide. So we had three questions when we started. Could one administer the vaccine by a route that was applicable for a vaccine? You can't give it by the bite of irradiated infected mosquitoes. Um, and all the mouse studies that had been done had been by inoculating intravenously, which is uh, we really can't, don't do that for vaccines. So we did an experiment right at the beginning where we gave sporozoites subcutaneously, like many of our vaccines, and we got 100% protection in mice. There's really no place to go after that except for the humans. The second was, could we produce adequate quantities of sporozoites? Everybody said it's impossible, you'll never be able to produce them. The answer is yes, and I'll tell you about that in a second. The third is, and this was the hardest one, could one at a reasonable cost produce attenuated sporozoites that meet regulatory requirements to be a vaccine? So what do you think the regulatory requirements to be a vaccine are? <coughs> what? The most important one is sterile, right? I mean, you can't be injecting stuff. And has anybody ever been in an insectary, like where you grow mosquitoes with malaria in them? Feels like you're in like the heart of darkness in Africa or something or like that. You can almost feel the fungi and the bacteria in the air and on the surfaces. Um, so how could we do this? Next slide. So we had to make a vaccine that was free. And you can't, if it's live, you can't sterilize it. It has to be sterile through the whole process, which takes six weeks to produce. And so we had to have it free of pathogens, free of uh, mosquito material, adequately attenuated so it wouldn't cause malaria, and potent, and it had to be stay potent in a bottle. And we had to develop a method of doing that. Next slide. <clears throat> so we did that. It took about two years, and we figured out how to do all of those things. And then we had to move from there. We had a group of laboratory scientists, none of whom had ever manufactured anything uh, or had any industry experience in, in manufacturing to make the vaccine. So fortunately, Dr. Sim, my, my wife, had actually worked as the head of R&D at a biotech company where she had manufactured about 40 kilograms of a anti-cancer agent uh, called angiostatin and endostatin um, under GMP that went into people intravenously. So she became the head of vice, she had her own company, but she became the head of manufacturing 
for Scenaria and worked with our scientists, next slide, over the course of a year, training them on how to do GMP, taking courses, writing the SOPs, batch records, and so on, and did 12 end-to-end -end practice runs during that year. Each one takes six weeks, so they were overlapping to get the team in shape to actually manufacture. Because there was no place else you could go to do this. Nobody had the capability, understanding, or facilities to do it. Next slide. And that, so they were ready to manufacture. And so in the spring of 2007, uh, we started to manufacture a vaccine for what's called preclinical toxicology studies. In order to get it passed with the FDA, you have to show in animals that it's safe and meets all these requirements of sterility, purity, potency, and, and, and attenuation. Next slide. And so when you manufacture, you don't manufacture more than you need. And we need to determine that in order to do the quality control release assays, again, which is sterility, purity, potency, and safety, and attenuation, uh, the stability studies to show that the stuff was, would work over time, the toxicology studies, the biodistribution studies, um, and to retain some, we needed 228 vials of vaccine. Next slide. And so uh, what you can see there is that we did four back-to-back -back production campaigns called 7, 8, 9, and 10 at two-week intervals so that it's a six-week process overlapping by two-week intervals and averaged 323 vials and always made the numbers we need. And to do that, we had to dissect 2,000 mosquitoes every day um, and vial that vaccine. Uh, next slide. And we did a, a series of assays on it, all of which passed. Next slide. And then we went into repeat dose rabbit studies uh, in which you actually give the highest dose that you're going to give to a human to rabbits, and you give one extra dose. And it, they passed all, you know, it was safe, it was non-toxic. But we were planning in the clinical trial to give the vaccine one group subcutaneously and the other intradermally. So one in the kind of the outer layer of your skin and uh, one subcutaneous. Now, does anybody know why we thought about doing intradermal in this, you know, the outer layer of the skin? Anybody doing any immunology work here on T-cells? What? Well, that's one thing. So mosquitoes inoculate sporozoites in the dermis. So we thought, hey, let's not try to get smarter than the mosquitoes. Let's do that. But also, the dermis is, is, has the highest concentration of uh, the important dendritic cells, the antigen-presenting cells, which are important for T cell responses. But it's really hard to give it in the dermis. But we had a lot of fighting back and forth and controversy with the funders. And finally, we convinced them to do two groups. Now, this is really astonishing. Next slide. So we did one group of rabbits, 24 rabbits. We gave the vaccine intradermally, males, females, and so on. And the other, we gave it subcutaneously. The exact same vaccine, the exact same dose, the exact same dosing interval, and the antibody responses were 10 to 15 times higher when we gave it intradermally versus subcutaneously. We didn't measure T cell responses. We don't do that in rabbits. But this is rather extraordinary. If you're me sitting here thinking about, I'm going to give this vaccine, which I really don't know how to give it. No one has any experience. And I've already shown just changing by a few millimeters where I put it can have this dramatic effect on the immune responses. How do I know what I'm doing? I mean, and I can't test everything. Uh, but so that's that result. And then we did some biodistribution studies, next slide. And they were, had no unexpected results. So we're now into, next slide, um, the situation where we had, uh, were manufacturing this in a place that was termed in National Geographic a dismal strip mall in Rockville, Maryland, uh, where we couldn't control the temperature. We couldn't control what was in the air. We had flooding. We would you know, freeze the place up and, and so on. And our GMP, can, and we, and we produced perfect material. It was sterile, pure, safe, and, and so on. But the GMP, the consultants for manufacturing, said there's not a chance in the world you're going to make a vaccine in this place and give it to people, even though it meets all those, you know, the testing requirements. Next slide. And so uh, we were fortunate to get a large grant from the PATH Malaria Vaccine Initiative, 
with money from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, about $30 million. And we were able to uh, rent a part of this facility here, only about 10% so far, but we're working on getting the rest of it. Um, and um, build from scratch a custom-made manufacturing facility because you can't go any place um, to manufacture in the process that we have. Next slide. And uh, in we we it was really re quite remarkable. We finished the engineering plans for the place in April of 2000. And seven, and we had our grand opening in October of 2007 of the world's first facility for manufacturing a live uh, malaria vaccine. And there we have a bunch of dignitaries, um, you know, other than um, uh, my wife and, and, and Gina Rubinovich from the Gates Foundation. It's kind of a series of middle-aged men. They're going bald, you know, cutting a ribbon there. Uh, but, but in any case, we opened the place up. Next slide. Uh, ran uh, some shakedown campaigns, and after well, we had a process that worked, right? I mean, we did it four times in a row. It was what they call in manufacturing robust, reproducible, consistent, and we moved it to a new facility. Now, how many people here have tried to move a immunology laboratory across the hall, all right? And how long does it take from the, the assays that worked year in, year out to work well? You know, a lot of people said, Steve, you're, you're nuts. I mean, it's never going to work. And I said, nah, it's going to work. We're, we know how to do this stuff. And so we went from being the best producers of sporozoites in the world to the worst. First, we couldn't grow the mosquitoes. Then we started having, like, you know, instead of 70,000 sporozoites per mosquito, 700. And we're going nuts. And you can imagine waking up at 4 in the morning. Now I've built this facility. I'm spending money like water, and nothing works. And you don't know if it's the water. It could be you know, different water. It could be this or that. Fortunately, um, the manufacturing team solved it. And um, we then moved, next slide. Uh, this is the team, uh, tremendously dedicated people, next slide, uh, to what we called production campaigns 20 to 25. Now remember, we started piece seven, eight, nine, and 10 where the tox runs. 11 to 19 didn't work, all right? And, uh, but then we went in and we nailed six in a row at two week intervals, and those were the, the lots of vaccine for the clinical trials. Next slide. And then here, again, we needed to make enough for the release quality control, release assays, retention samples, stability assays, and the first clinical trial, which has 100 volunteers in it, which is huge for a first in humans clinical trial. Next slide. And here again, we made, if you look at the bottom row, we needed about 440 vials. We made an average of 570. We always made what we needed. We averaged about 70,000 sporozoites per mosquito, which is really incredibly high. Next slide. And, and did about 2,800 mosquitoes dissected per day. Um, and then we did a whole series of assays, which, next slide, are listed here. We culture the eggs, the pupae, the mosquitoes, the blood meals, and if anything is positive, it all gets thrown out. And the team, led by Dr. Billingsley back there, the quality assurance team, we turned an entomologist into a quality assurance specialist. And everything, essentially, you know, 99% of what we cultured was sterile. So uh, it, it's really quite remarkable. I can't believe it that we can go for six weeks with mosquitoes and all this stuff and all these moving parts and come up with a sterile product at the end. Next slide. And these are just some of the kind of tests that you do, uh, which are pretty standard. Next slide. Next. And then we went on to stability studies. Next slide. And uh, I just say that you can see here that it's stable now. We, we've gone out to 30 months and it's stable. Next slide which is unheard of for vaccines, because that's what we, we, cryo, we cryopreserve this in the vapor phase of liquid nitrogen, which is a new way of doing vaccines. It's done for veterinary vaccines, but not yet for a human vaccine. Next slide. And uh, you know, the, the tox lots are now out to 18 months. And we've cultured 11.7% of them uh, in, in an outside contract sterility lab, and they're all sterile. Next slide. So now we get to what's called an IND, an investigational new drug application. We submit that, hopefully, to the FDA within about 10 days. The FDA is allowed 30 days to respond to you. 
if they don't respond at the end of 30 days, you start your clinical trial. Um, so the talk, clock will be ticking in about 10 days to two weeks. Next slide. And we have our first phase one trial with Challenge in the United States. Next slide. Uh, and it's going to be run by uh, two teams, the U.S. Uh, Military Malaria Vaccine Program from the Naval Medical Research Center, Dr. Judy Epstein and Tom Ritchie, and the University of Maryland Center for Vaccine Development. We have two teams because it's too big for one team to, to do this trial. They have done an incredible amount of work, Dr. Kirsten Lake and Bob Edelman, on putting together the protocols. They've had to go through five what are called IRBs, Investigational Review Boards, Committees for Protection of Human Subjects, because of all the organizations that are involved. Next slide. Next slide. And so uh, this kind of uh, goes over the design of the trial, um, and it's called a dose escalation study. So we start with a low dose. Up there on the left, it says 7,500 sporozoites per dose. The next dose is 30,000 sporozoites per dose. And the last one is 135,000 sporozoites per dose. And you, you give the first one, and if everybody's okay, after three weeks, you go to a safety board, and they give your permission to give the 30,000 dose. And then you wait for several weeks, bring, put all the data together, and go to the board, and they give you permission to go to the 135,000 dose. There'll be four doses at four-week intervals, and then at three weeks after the last dose, everybody gets challenged by the bite of five mosquitoes that are carrying live sporozoites. There is a fourth group at the bottom that is not going to get challenged initially uh, because the FDA asked us to observe them to make sure there's no breakthrough infections from the parasite. And half of the volunteers, 7 and 7, 11 and 11 and so on, will get the vaccine subcutaneously and half will get it intradermally. And this next slide. And this adds up to, these are the numbers of volunteers you can see in the different groups. It's a total of 104 because we have six infectivity controls. If everybody, anybody wants to sign up to come up for that, you don't get the vaccine, but you get malaria. And you're guaranteed to get malaria. <laughs> so we have to have that because how else can you determine if the vaccine works? Um, and we've done that now to over like 1,300 people very safely. Um, and uh, people really... Uh, it, it's remarkable the number of people who volunteer. They get paid also, but they really want to be in, involved in this type of work. Next slide. Next. And this is just the timeline uh, that, you know, submitting the IND at the end of this month, starting recruitment in the end of next month, and the first immunizations, and we'll have protection data by next October, November. Next slide. Uh, there's a whole series of, of antibody and T cell studies that will be done. Next slide. Um, and here is something I'd like to stress. And so I've done, I don't know, 30 vaccine trials, and I've done them in as few as 10 people, and I've done it in 20, you know, 20,000 people on the island of Sumatra with a typhoid vaccine in the late 1980s. Um, they, we're breaking entirely new ground here. We don't know anything. We start a study, and we don't know how many doses to give. We don't know the volume. Should you give it in 200 microliters or 500 microliters? Should you give it in the arm, the leg, the rear end, you know, the nose? Some people have suggested the ear. Um, should you give, you know, what's the interval between the doses? What's the best way to do this? And nobody has any idea. And you obviously, the only way to test it is human beings. And we have no way of doing this many studies in human beings. So you're always taking your best guess. And it's scary. You know, you invest five years. By the time we finish this study, we'll have invested almost $60 million in this. And we're shooting, in some respects, from the dark. Um, so we're trying to minimize, but there's all kinds of issues that we're going to have to test in what we call clinical vaccinology. Now, by the time we get done, in order to get this over the finish line, which means a licensed vaccine, anybody have any estimates of what it will cost? So what it, with, you know, I'm sure somebody must have here demonstrated about how bad the pharmaceutical industry is and how much money they charge and so on. It costs at least a billion dollars for us to get this finished. Because you have to do all this stuff. And you have to do safety in thousands and thousands of people. It's an extraordinarily expensive process. Um, 
to get it finished. Next slide. And so we have a clinical development plan is how do we achieve a successful biologics license application and commercialization as soon as possible. And that involves, next slide, studies will done with experimental challenge here in the United States because we can actually immunize and challenge, immunize and challenge, figure out some of these dosing issues. Next slide. As well as um, clinical development plan with field studies that will be done primarily in Africa but potentially in other parts of the world. Um, and which uh, the first one will probably be done in Ghana and follow immediately, you know, after after this this, this first trial, and hopefully it'll start in uh, next, you know, late fall or, or uh, January. Next slide. Uh, so we've already had a site visit team that's gone to four countries in Africa to plan for the trial that comes on, you know, comes on from the Malaria Vaccine Initiative, the Center for Vaccine Development, the University of Maryland the Malaria uh, con, uh, con, uh, Clinical Trial Alliance from Africa, and the Naval Medical Research Unit in Ghana. Next slide. And this just shows the different places that they, they've gone. Next slide. And then the question is, how do we get the vaccine there? No one's ever delivered a vaccine in vapor phase of liquid nitrogen before. So we got a $3 million grant from the NIH to figure out how to do that. Next slide. And. Uh, Basically, Dr. Eric James from our lab got the slide, you know, shipped it to Ghana. First question is, can you get it out of customs in time in Ghana, right? We've all had problems with that. Uh, next slide. And uh, this is picking it up at customs with the, the team from the Noguchi Memorial Institute of Medical Research in Accra. Um, and to make a long story short, if you look up there, he shipped it from uh, Washington. It went to England then down to Ghana by another small plane out to uh, a, a smaller airport in northern Ghana, and then by Jeep out to the site. At each site, he had to test it. He had to look at the data recorders and so on, and then he shipped it all the way back. And then we tested it for viability and potency. And this was just done in August, and it works. I mean, the system works, and we think that we have a very viable way of doing this and expanding it and making it practical for a vaccine. Next slide. So that's great. We've done all this. We're going to be testing this vaccine. It could be, if all goes well, that by the end of this year we'll have really strong data about how effective it is. But how do we go from producing my 550 vials and so on? I hope each vial will have five doses of vaccine in it. We can't know what the dose is until we test it to producing enough to immunize 100 million children, or you know, 25 million children. Um, we have to go back to the laboratory now, increase the efficiency of production, figure out how to scale it up, uh, figure out, you know, have to do something called validation, which is incredibly expensive. You have to be able to show that you could take five operators and they all can do the same thing reproducibly, because your, your manufacturing process is so good. Um, and then we have to design a facility to build it in, and it won't be for the, for the you know, 100 million doses a year, it'll probably be for 10 million first. And uh, so, tremendous amount of work that's going to have to go on, really exciting. Next slide. And then uh, we're trying to optimize the whole process. So we're now, right now we attenuate the parasites by radiation, alternatively we could uh, attenuate them by genetic deletion. So we can knock out particular genes, and we actually published on that with our collaborators from Nijmegen uh, earlier in, at the end of 2008. So we can make genetically attenuated sporozoites. The whole world is working on making mosquitoes that don't support malaria transmission or dengue transmission. We have a grant from the NIH to make mosquitoes that make more parasites in the kingdom uh, by genetically altering the parasites. And then we're working on extraction, formulation, and so on and so forth. Logistics, how we give it. How do we give the vaccine best? Next slide. So um, in closing, let me just say that if we think about malaria vaccines in the transition from scale up to what's now the gauntlet's been thrown down by Bill and Melinda Gates to go for eradication, elimination of plasmodium falciparum, then eradication of malaria. Uh, next, 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 next. So um, we can think about 
different phases in this, and this is, of course, truncated. You know, from scale-up coverage to disease and transmission elimination is a lot of years. Uh, and, and then to final eradication. If we think about the role of vaccines in that process, next. So we have vaccines that reduce morbidity and mortality without preventing transmission. I told you that that's what everyone else is working on, except for a scenario. And the only other vaccine that's, you know, the one that's further ahead, which is called the RTSS, doesn't prevent infection. It just delays the time until you get infected and thereby reduces morbidity and hopefully mortality. Those would be very useful in the first phases of control, which is actually what we're doing now with bed nets, spraying, good drugs, and so on. But next, if we want to eliminate, then we have to have a vaccine that prevents transmission, either by preventing infection, pre-erythrocytic, meaning infection, meaning blood stage infection, or preventing transmission to the mosquitoes. Um, and so we're actually working on both of those. Our vaccine I told you about is the pre-erythrocytic vaccine, the sporozoite, but we can also produce parasites that could be used for another type of vaccine to prevent transmission to mosquitoes. And these are independent mechanisms. And if you combine them, suppose you had a 90% effective vaccine that prevented the sporozoites from ever getting out of the liver into the bloodstream, and then you had a vaccine that was 90% effective against preventing the mosquitoes from being infected, that's 99%. That by itself would eliminate malaria anywhere. So it's a big challenge, but that's where we're working on. Next slide. Next slide. So how good is good enough? You know, again, get back to, you know, I feel that good enough means 80, 90, 95% protective. We'll just have to see. I may tell a different story in six months when we come back here and, and get, you know, less protection. We just have, we just don't know. Next slide. Uh, we've been fortunate in working with many, many groups throughout the world in doing this. It couldn't possibly have been done just by the people even on our team, which is now 50 people, particularly PATH Malaria Vaccine Initiative, uh, Protein Potential LSC, and the U.S. Military Malaria Vaccine Program. Next slide. Funding has come from the NIH, uh, the U.S. Army. The, we even got an earmark. You know, you know those terrible things, earmarks? Without an earmark, scenario, four million scenario would never have existed. Um, and uh, next slide. We have tremendous uh, committees which have helped us gratis, so we don't pay any of our advisory committees, which are really made up of the luminaries of the world in their different areas, uh, and they've all just chipped in to, you know, to work on this. Very unusual, I mean, unprecedented for a company to have all people donating their time to help. Next slide. And this is the team that gets up every single day um, with a dream of making a malaria vaccine that's going to prevent millions of deaths of children in the world. And that's the team at home. That's actually in a place called Luang Prabang, which is in Laos. That's the Mekong River. That was last August and so on. That's the home team that keeps me going. Thank them. Thank you.